It was a uh, joy to take a look at the book of Jonah uh, this morning. And uh, this evening, we're moving into chapter 2. Uh, this is a day of celebration, as it is the first time I have covered an entire chapter in uh, one service. So we'll see if we can keep this going and actually finish Jonah uh, by the end of the month. So this morning, we're going to be look, or this evening, we're looking at Jonah chapter 2. But it was uh, brought to my attention this morning that uh, I didn't actually finish chapter 1. We had Jonah thrown out of the boat. He's in the water, but he hadn't been swallowed by the fish yet. So uh, actually, we're going to start with Jonah chapter 1, verse 17, and then we'll read through uh, chapter 2. Uh, also, uh, I realized this morning, I appreciated that some folks came and confess that uh, they were flipping around looking for Jonah. It is one of those two-page books and uh, can fool you. So kind of go to Daniel and then flip on into the minor prophets a few. Um, Obadiah is just before Jonah. If you get as far as Matthew and start the New Testament, you've gone too far. But why don't we stand together and let's read, beginning in Jonah chapter 1, verse 17, and then we will read through the entire second chapter. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish. And he said, I called out in my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depths of Sheol, and you heard my voice. For you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All of your breakers and billows passed over me, so I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again towards your, temp your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains, and the earth with its bars was around, was around me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you and praise you for the faithful recording of the book of Jonah. We thank you, Father, that you have faithfully recorded not just the good and the pleasant stories about men and women who were faithful and obedient. You have faithfully recorded for us the lives of those who were not always obedient. And Lord, you have given them to us as a means of instruction for us and as an example. So we pray that you would grant us ears to hear and eyes to see what you would teach us in the book of Jonah this evening from the second chapter. And we would ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Well, please be seated. Now, in a spirit of full disclosure, I have to tell you that the interpretation that I'm giving you tonight on the second chapter of Jonah is a minority report. Um, it's not original with me. I first came across this perspective on the book, uh, the, the core of what I'm sharing, uh, some years ago when I was taking a class entitled Missions in the Old Testament. And how can you do missions in the Old Testament without reading Jonah, right? And, uh, but as I prepared for tonight and worked through what I wanted to share, uh, I went through over 25 uh, commentaries, and none of them agreed with me. Um, I went out online and I listened to a couple sermons by men you would whose names you would recognize and we highly respect, and they didn't agree with me. 
So this evening, if you don't agree with me, you are in very good company. If you do agree with me, I'm not sure what that says about you. Uh, but I want to assure you that regardless of the take on the passage, what I'm sharing is certainly not outside of what the Scriptures teach us. Um, but it is a take on Jonah that, uh, uh, and on this prayer that is a little different than what we normally may read. And you might have picked that up from the title of the message, which is The Art of Being a Biblical Bigot. Um, because as I read this prayer in context, I hear the prayer of a man who is still insisting before God that he is right and God is wrong. Most of that context will be seen as we walk through the prayer tonight, but I would like to give a little bit of context in the book, and that is this morning as we read in chapter 1, it was very clear that Jonah is in a deep disagreement with God. By the time he gets dropped into the water, he has not agreed with God. And then we see in chapter 3, we do see Jonah going to Nineveh in obedience. And we'll look at that uh, and see actually that the focus there is not so much on Jonah, but what on the amazing thing that God does, what happens in Nineveh. But then we get to chapter 4, and very clearly Jonah hasn't changed his mind. Jonah is insisting in chapter 4 on the same reason that he ran in chapter 1. There's been no change in Jonah. So to see repentance or a turn of change of heart in chapter 2 makes no sense in light of what's happening in chapters 1, 3, and 4. Now as we get in, we'll also, as we get into the passage, we'll also see uh, where I believe uh, there's, there's still a high-handed raised fist of rebellion on Jonah's part toward God. It has to do with that what Jonah says and what Jonah doesn't say. So we saw this morning that the motivation of Jonah's fight against God, his flight from God, was that he, he, he is a uh, racist and uh, he is a nationalist. And on that basis, and because he wants to defend Israel before he wants to obey God, he flees from God. And so, uh, again, I want to point out that when I speak of uh, being a nationalist or, or national, I'm not speaking of a proper love for our country, a proper appreciation for, for what's enjoyed by those who are citizens of a nation. But when that love gets raised above our love for God, and when that love then becomes an idol, then certainly we will disobey God. We will rebel against God when that happens. And that's what happened with Jonah. <clears throat> so he hated the people of Nineveh. And in this prayer, Jonah artfully clothes his bigotry in what appears to be a very respectable religious garb. And we have to remember as we do this that, that the book of Jonah is not just about Jonah himself. It's about the people of Israel. Because all of Israel shares this problem. Through all of Israel's difficult history, most of its time of disobedience, they still had the temple functioning. They were still in the process of making sacrifices. They were still in the process of, of, of celebrating the festivals. Judah, for most of those years, was faithful in doing that, and yet God was still sending prophet after prophet after prophet, calling them to repent. Because despite the religious ritual they were in disobedience and rebellion against God. And they hated those who are outside. So nationalism, even when it's dressed, I'm sorry, racism and nationalism, even when it's dressed in the garb of ritual and religion, doesn't make it any better. It is still sin. <clears throat> One of the things that we observe in this prayer as we read it, as if you were listening as we went through, there was actually no repentance in the prayer. Uh, there's even no petition. Jonah's not asking for anything. It is a prayer of thanksgiving. It is a prayer of, of gratefulness for deliverance, and I think that is genuine. Jonah was actually in a very frightening place, a very terrifying place. 
and God had delivered him, and he was genuinely grateful to God. And what is true of Jonah is something that's true about us. Jonah was a mixed bag. It was very possible for Jonah to be truly grateful to God for God's deliverance and at the same time still be in rebellion against God. I should say this as I get started, too, because uh, in verse 17 we saw of, of chapter 1, we saw Jonah get thrown into the water, and he's swallowed by a great fish. And uh, usually that's all that it's about when we talk about Jonah. But I, 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 if, if I don't say something, then everybody will ask, uh, what swallowed Jonah? A great fish. God appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. Uh, not a whale. There would have been a word for that. It's a great fish. Can great fish swallow people whole? Probably not. Did this one swallow Jonah whole? Yes. This book is full of miracles. The storm was a miracle. The stopping of the storm is a miracle. The, the conversion of, of Nineveh is a great miracle. The growth of the vine is a miracle. The death of the vine is a miracle. Everything in this book is a miracle. We don't need to make this fish story anything else. This is a miracle. Some kind of fish swallowed Jonah, and he was down in those juices without air for three days. That's a miracle. God is doing miracles in this book. So I can't explain about the fish and about Jonah in three, down there for three days except that, that God chose to work this way. So the title is How to Be the Art of Being a Biblical Bigot, and what I'd like to do is look at the qualities of, we see of a biblical bigot in Jonah's life. And uh, the first one is, a uh, to be a biblical bigot, we need to know the Word of God, but reject the heart of God. To know the Word of God, but reject the heart of God. You'll note that uh, in print, uh, I have the word biblical in biblical uh, bigot in quotes. Because, in fact, it's not possible to be biblical and a bigot at the same time. However, to look at Jonah, you wouldn't know that. He does very well handling the Word of God and managing to be a bigot all at the same time. He was a master of the Bible, and still he was a bigot. He was controlled by pride. He was controlled by hate, not by the Spirit of God. So Jonah clearly knows the Word of God. Well, there's only probably one actual quote from a psalm in this prayer. The entire prayer just parallels the psalms. He's obviously a man who knows the psalms. The clear parallels here between Psalm 18, Psalm 42, Psalm 88, Psalm 120, Psalm 130, just constantly his, his, his frame of reference is clearly the Word of God and the Psalms, and he handles them so well. When he explains in chapter 4 why it is he's rebelling against God, why he didn't want to go to Nineveh, he quotes the very words of God spoken to Moses back in Exodus chapter 34. So Jonah was a scholar of the Word. He knew the Word well, but he did not know the heart of God. And for those of us who are people who treasure the Word of God, we must always be sensitive to this, the possibility of this sin. Because we rightfully treasure and hold the Word of God in a place of respect and honor. And we do that rightfully. And groups who do that have a tendency to sin in this area. So we must be careful. Paul himself warned the church in Corinth about this. In 2 Corinthians 3, 6, he's speaking and he says, God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter but of the Spirit, for the letter kills but the Spirit gives life. The Word of God, apart from the Spirit of God, kills. That's what he's saying. The Word of God, apart from the Spirit of God, kills. We desperately need the Spirit of God if the Word of God will bring us life and if through us we can use the Word of God to lead others into life. 
speaking to the Pharisees, uh, who were the great Bible scholars of the day, Jesus said this. He said, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is these who testify about me. Jesus says the whole point of the Scriptures is to bring us to Jesus, to open our eyes to who He is, to show us who He is. He says, He's talking about the Old Testament. He says, this whole book, before Matthew, you search it, and it's about me. That's where you find life. The book is designed for us, given to us, so that we might know God for who He is. And it's important that you understand, I'm not saying that it's given to us so that we might have some kind of simply subjective experience or some kind of emotional experience. You know, it's the same thing Pastor John so often talked to us about in terms of salvation, those 18 inches between knowing the truth and having the truth in our hearts by faith. That's not just about the initial gospel that we hear and respond to. That is about our whole relationship with this book. It's never intended to simply park here. It must always move to our hearts by faith as we seek to know Him in His Word. So the first quality of a biblical bigot is to know the Word of God while rejecting the very heart of God. And the second one is to stubbornly refuse fellowship with God. Stubbornly refuse fellowship with God. Let me read chapter 117 again, and then the first verse of chapter 2. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish. Did you catch that? How many days was Jonah in the fish before he prays? Three Three days and three nights, then Jonah prays. I don't know about you, but I just started praying a lot earlier than that. <laughs> you know, one day, my young, younger son Eric and I were driving down from northern Michigan back into the Detroit area. We were on 75, just north of Detroit, and the road there is about uh, six lanes wide, and uh, it had been, uh, uh, there had been a snowstorm, uh, it was cold, they had cleared the road, and the road appeared to be in very good shape. The operative word there is appeared, and we hit black ice. Eric was doing everything he should do. It had nothing to do with his driving. We hit the black ice, and we started to spin. And I remember as we spun around, at one point, you know, we're going backwards, and there's six lanes of cars rushing forward toward us. And I'm thinking, they're going to hit the same black ice. We, we are all over the place here. And you know what I did? I prayed. I didn't wait three days. <laughs> I did not wait three days. I prayed. What was Jonah thinking? Jonah is in the middle of the huge storm on the ship, and he doesn't pray. They pick him up and throw him into the water. He doesn't pray. He gets swallowed by a fish. He doesn't pray. He's in the fish one whole day, one whole night. He doesn't pray. Second day, second night, he doesn't pray. Third day, third night, and he prays. What is going on? Well, remember what we saw this morning in the first chapter. Jonah would rather die than obey God. Jonah would rather die than talk to God. He's down in that fish just like this. You can't make me go to Nineveh. About day three, maybe he's changing his mind. He probably decided he can't wait God out. Actually, because he's a type of Jesus, because Jesus said as Jonah was three days, three nights in the whale, or in the fish, uh, he was going to come out of that fish. But Jonah's down there, and he's refusing to pray. Because... He's into this disagreement with God. He's at war with God. And he's refusing to talk to God. And he stays in there and he refuses to talk to God. <clears throat> I think Jonah's plan was that the sailors would throw him off the ship and he would die. 
and he wouldn't go to Nineveh. Jonah would win, God would lose. He didn't expect that God would preserve his life in the belly of a fish. God does preserve him. Now, you have to know this doesn't make any of the experience for Jonah less terrifying. It's a terrifying experience for Jonah. I don't want to make light of that at all. Jonah is an amazing man. The things that, the, 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 the stamina of this guy, uh, the courage of this guy is amazing. And he describes in this psalm just how terrifying it is for him. It's equal, it's, it is terrifying. But he's only there because he's resisting God. And so he's resisting talking to God. He doesn't want to have fellowship with God. And that's one of the qualities of a biblical bigot. Now we have to ask each one of ourselves in our own lives, are our lives marked by frequency of fellowship with God? Do we seek out fellowship with God? Or do we avoid fellowship with God? Maybe we don't outright raise our fist and say, I won't meet with you, God, but somehow there's always something else that's more important than meeting with God. We're not hungry for fellowship with Him. And if that's the case, maybe we need to search our hearts and say, is there something in my life like what was in Jonah's life? Is there an area of disobedience I need to repent from so that as the psalmist says that that uh, delight in the Lord would be rekindled. So, qualities of a biblical, biblical bigot, to know the Word of God but reject the heart of God, to stubbornly refuse fellowship with God, and to blame God for the suffering that results from my sin. Look at verse uh, 3. Verse 3, for you, 3 in the beginning of 4. For you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me, and all your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. When did that happen? When did God expel Jonah from his sight? Didn't happen. Never happened. Jonah did flee from the presence of God. God did not expel him. Jonah fled from God. And in case we just happen to miss that, in case we just happen to miss that, we have to look back at chapter 1 where three times we are told that. Chapter 1, verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish to flee from the presence of the Lord. <coughs> Twice, we're told, his whole motivation is to get away from the presence of the Lord. Verse 10, the sailors, after they found out what's going on, say to him, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, and how did they know it? Because he told them. God did not cast Jonah out of his presence. Jonah fled out of the presence of God. Yet now he blames God for his circumstance. He departed from God, and then he says, God, you forced me out. He takes the part of an innocent, submissive servant that somehow is inexplicably suffering under the hand of this God. He blames God. Beginning of verse 3, for you cast me into the sea and into the heart of the seas. Yes, he did. Jonah's half right here. God did have him cast into the depths of the sea. That's right. And why did God do that? Because Jonah was in rebellion. It wasn't like God was just capricious and decided to toss him overboard. God's in the process of trying to draw Jonah back. And Jonah's in the process of fleeing from God. And in that flight, he ends up in the deeps. He ends up in the seas. Because of his own rebellion, he's not in the ship because he didn't repent. Had he repented in the ship, he would not be in the sea and he would not be in the fish. God is responsible because God's trying to draw him back. 
But the blame for the circumstance rests squarely on Jonah. How do we be biblical bigots? We know the word of God, but reject the heart of God. We stubbornly refuse fellowship with God. We blame God for the suffering that results from our own sin. And then we substitute religious ritual for obedience. We substitute religious ritual for obedience. The second half of verse 4, Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. And then down in verse 9, But I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. Two observations. First related to verse 4, God's issue with Jonah is not getting Jonah to Jerusalem and to the temple. There's no evidence here that Jonah doesn't delight in temple worship. I think God knows Jonah delights in temple worship. Jonah would rather be in the temple. But that's not where God sent him. Jonah's saying, get me out of the fish so I can go back to the temple. And God's saying, I don't want you at the temple. I want you in Nineveh. Jonah wants nothing to do with the temple. He wants ritual worship without obedience. That's what he wants. The second observation from verse 9 is where he says, I will sacrifice to you. And that sounds very good. But when it's coming from the mouth of a man who's committed to disobedience, it's not very good. In fact, we know what God thinks of such a sacrifice. When Saul, the first king of Israel, also preferred ritual over obedience, his sacrifice was rejected. And Samuel spoke these, two, these words to him in 1 Samuel 15, 22 to 23. 1 Samuel 15, 22 to 23. Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and the, to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. God does not want ritual practice from a man whose heart is caught in idolatry. And that's the case with Jonah. God seeks obedience above sacrifice. And even in our own situation, our ritual obedience or our ritual attendance at church, our ritual maybe even service at church is no substitute for obedience. And the thing is, as we look at one another, we cannot see with our human eyes when such activity is obedience and when, when such activity is not. This is something that you can only know in your own heart. But I would say this, that for Jonah there was no question. We're not talking about maybe this, maybe this. I mean, Jonah was in rebellion against God. He was clothing it intentionally in religious garb, and he wanted to be involved in religious activity, ritual activity. If this is a case in your life, you know it. You know it to be true if it's true in your life right now. It's not something you have to pray about because it's coming out of a space of active disobedience and rebellion against God. So I say that because sometimes people with very sensitive spirits hear these kinds of things and they get all kind of, now I don't know. and they get this No, Jonah was in open rebellion against God and yet pretending to be religious. That's what God cannot tolerate. Qualities of a biblical big, bigot, they know the word of God but reject the heart of God. They stubbornly refuse fellowship with God Blame God for the suffering that results from my sin and substitute religious ritual for obedience. And finally, correct God's theology. Correct God's theology. Verse 8 and 9. Well, let me just read just verse 8. Jonah's praying, Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. Kind of a Strange verse. What's, what's he saying? What's he saying here? Verse 8 is perhaps the most disturbing verse in the prayer. 
because in it Jonah is correcting what he believes to be God's mistakes, God's misdirected compassion. And John, Jonah is explaining to God why his racism and why his nationalism is appropriate and why it's okay. And the reason this is such a disturbing verse is that it almost sounds right. Jonah does a good job here. So who is John talking about in this verse? Who is he thinking about? Who are the idolaters that this book is about? It's about Nineveh, right? We're talking about Nineveh. Those idolaters are the ones he's talking about. He's reminding God about those idolaters, and then he says they forsake their faithfulness. What does that mean? New King James says forsake their own mercy. The ESV says forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I think the NET says it in a way that we actually can grasp and understand what it is at the heart of Jonah's prayer. He says they forfeit the mercy that could be theirs. Idolaters have forfeited the mercy that could be theirs. Well, my paraphrase Jonah then, he's saying, God, you are wrong to offer mercy to those Ninevites. They are idolaters, and they have forfeited that right. You are wrong, God, to offer them what they have forfeited. They have no right to it. God, I am the one who is right. I recognize what's just here. Now, we know that Jonah does end up going to Nineveh, but it's not because he agrees with God. Again, we'll see that. He doesn't agree with God to the end of the book. That's made clear. And all of this is clothed in religious words, but it springs from a heart of rebellion. God, I'm right, and you are wrong. You are wrong to extend to them mercy. When we begin to instruct God, when we begin to explain to God why that person ought not be forgiven, when we begin to explain to God why that person ought not be loved, because we know what God doesn't know, we're very close to practicing the art of being a biblical bigot. Well, then God commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up into the dry land. I believe the word vomit was not a random vocabulary choice of God. I think it reflects God's response to the prayer of Jonah and to the fact that God is still going to put Jonah where God wants Jonah, regardless of how careful he has been to couch all of this in religious-sounding terminology. Now, despite all the flaws in Jonah, despite his unrepentant heart, despite his racism and his nationalism and his refusal to obey God, his desire to, this manipulative prayer that he comes up with, God still delivers him. Hallelujah. As I said this morning, if we just look at Jonah, this is a discouraging book, but when you look at what God is doing, it's encouraging. God is using all of these things to deliver Jonah from his own hatred, his own bigotry, his own pride, and conform him to the Lord Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, what's encouraging about that is that that is the way God is with all who are in covenant with him. He is committed to each one of us in the same way, regardless of how good we are at running away, at avoiding him. He is always working to draw us back into fellowship with himself. He is more concerned about our transformation into Christ's likeness than we are. For Jonah, it was racism and nationalism. Perhaps for some of us, it's many other things. Could be dishonesty, could be destructive speech, could be sexual immorality or impatience or greed. The list goes on and on. But know this, God's love is stronger than our sin. His compassion toward us is as great as his limitless power. And he is always at work in our lives through the storms and through the times of quietness to draw us back to himself.
Praise God. Sometimes that kind of insistent compassion is uncomfortable and even unwelcomed. But it is our only hope. Jesus Christ will complete in us that good work which he has begun. Father, how we thank you not for the practices of Jonah as he sought to manipulate you through his prayer, but, Father, for your compassion and graciousness to Jonah despite that prayer. Because, Father, that means we have great hope as well. Lord, I pray that you would be gracious to each one of us to open our eyes. If there are areas in which we are experiencing the uh, practices of being Uh, biblical sinners practicing our sin but seeking to look religious in the process. Father, I pray that you would graciously and powerfully reveal that to us, that we might repent. Father, that we might become those who not only experience your compassion but share it with others. And we would ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Well, thank you all very much.